Okay, are you ready, uh, Jerry? I'm going to give an introduction, and then we'll just turn it over to you, and you're the boss, okay? Sure. Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Mike Russell. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome everybody, both from the Kansas Wesleyan University campus community and the Salina community at large, to our event tonight. This is the 15th annual Holocaust Remembrance that the Kansas Wesleyan Department of History has sponsored over the last 17 years. I want to begin by thanking first and foremost the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education in Overland Park for providing tonight's guest speaker to KWU. I also want to thank Drs. Paula Freed and Brad Stewie for providing financial support for tonight's event. And last but certainly not least, the following people here at KWU, Melissa Anderson, KWU Director of Advancement and University Events, Kay Quinn, KWU Assistant Director of Stewardship and University Events, and Luke Golgoski and Joshua Nelson, technicians in the KWU Information Systems Office. Tonight's event would not have been possible without their contributions. Our special guest speaker tonight is Dr. Jerry Crane. She is going to share with us the amazing and interesting story about her mother's survival during the Holocaust. Dr. Crane is currently the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the Crichton, School, Crichton University School of Dentistry in Omaha. She actually holds two doctorates. Her Doctor of Dental Sciences degree was earned at the University of Washington in Seattle and her PhD in Organizational Development and Change at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Her mother, Ms. Alice Kern, was a survivor of the Auschwitz death camp in Poland and the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in Germany from which she was liberated in 1945. In addition to speaking about her experiences to audiences for many years, Alice Kern also wrote a book entitled Tapestry of Hope. The KW History Department has recently ordered a signed copy of this book, and it should be available in Memorial Library very soon. At the end of tonight's presentation, a limited number of questions will be taken by the audience via submission to the Zoom chat option. My friends, please join me and welcome Dr. Jerry Crane. Thank you, Mike, so much. And thank you for the um, opportunity to speak tonight. I am, um, I'm, I'm really honored. Let me ask you one thing. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can Wonderful. See that. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, yes, I thank you. But um, I think more important, if my mother were here, she would thank you as well. She would thank um, you all for your interest in the topic. Um, you've had a long history of inviting speakers, um, and and that's very meaningful. And um, that you uh, ordered a copy of the of her book for your library. My mother never intended to write a book. I can tell you about that as the story unfolds. But what she would like is that if somebody were to read a book that they um, pass it along or pass along the, the messages that, uh, that my mother learned, um, having been a survivor of the Holocaust. Actually, both of my parents are. Um, and that will come out a little bit during the story as well. I intend to um, go into some detail. I know we've got um, people, I believe, of varying learner ages. Um, and so I will uh, keep my comments um, to appropriate age level. And, but I'm so thankful that we have about 45 minutes to an hour to go into some details of the story. But then what I really look forward to is engaging in some kind of um, dialogue at the end. Some people call it Q&A. I like to call it Q&D, question and discussion. Let's see if we can do it uh, through Zoom. I'm gonna go ahead and... As I'm telling uh, my mother's story, there are a couple of things I would love for you to listen for. I may or may not state them explicitly, but if we loop back around in the end and you let me know if you picked up something about resilience during crisis, about living through social injustice and discrimination, and about coming together in hope and healing. So how many of you um, have read Elie Wiesel's Night? It used to be um, 
assigned at uh, oftentimes at a college or high school level. And now more recently, um, they're assigning it as reading in the middle school as well. Um, Elie Wiesel, who wrote Night and who was really um, a Nobel laureate and kind of the spokesperson for Holocaust survivors, uh, grew up near my mom. They're from the same hometown, uh, Siget, Romania. In fact, when my mom would speak and to audiences of students and, and they say, oh, Alice, did you know Ellie Wiesel? She would say, Ellie? Oh yeah, he was a scrawny little brother of a girlfriend of mine. So he, she would, used to say, he just studied all the time. So fast forward, he becomes a Nobel laureate, but okay. So just to get our bearings, there's Europe, there's Romania, and the tip of that arrow is pointing to a little town. It's not even on the map. It is along a river and it's called Siget, Romania. And nowadays we hear a lot about Ukraine in the news and you can look to the right of Romania and you can see there's Moldova, but also down at the bottom, um, there's a little bit of Romania that uh, that you can see and also just uh, to the right of Moldova. So real close. Um, uh, so that's the kind of the part of the world we're in. But Siget is a very lovely small town. I've been to it. I'll tell you about that a little bit later and show you some pictures. But when my mom was living there, um, it was a thriving little town. They used to call it the Little Paris. So um, that tells you they had a lot of pride, but also their parts of it were kind of fancy, kind of nice. Um, and uh, my mom was born in 1923 in this little town of Siget, Romania. Here is a more contemporary picture, but um, when I visited in 1995, it looked just like this. And when she was there, she said, it looked just like this too. That's a movie theater in town. So again, small town, but look how well kept it is, how pretty it is. And I'm going to talk about um, not only the theater, but uh, those streets on either side of the theater, because they had some sidewalks that um, were very near and dear to my mom's. <clears throat> family and to herself when she was growing up. So she's the little one. She's the girl um, over there on the right, um, together with her brother and her mom and dad ah, in front of the movie theater. And there was one more brother and he was older and he was already in medical school at the Sorbonne in Paris. So um, that was what their family um, was uh, looked like. And my mom, growing up, she loved music. She loved dancing. She took piano lessons. Um, this was her in a school play. She was called the Red Rose. And she loved roses. She loved dancing. She just, this, this was her dream. Um, she also really enjoyed hanging out with her friends. So think about it. Back then, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't even have phones. The way that teenagers would socialize after school is they would get together and go for walks. And my mom's in the middle. And this was that her two girlfriends going for a walk on one of those sidewalks that goes along the downtown area by the movie theater. <clears throat> she said they loved those walks. They would get dressed up a little. I um, mean, look at her sweater and her little checkered skirt. They would get dressed up, she said, because you never knew who you were going to see or be seen by someone. So she would talk about having a crush on someone, a boy at school or whatever, and you might see them on the street. And that's how they socialized back then. She loved it. Um, she went to school and um, she took French lessons. She got a private uh, English tutor as well. So she took French, she took English, she loved her music, studied all the other things, but she said, yeah, I wasn't the greatest student, but um, she enjoyed it. She really did. She had a little dog named Lily, little white poodle named Lily, and um, they had a good life. Her dad was, owned a shop in town 
um, it was like, an, I guess you would say like a little import or delicatessen deli. Um, and, and that was neat because one of the things that her dad did was give space to the Sinta and Roma. Roma. So they, back then they called the, that group of um, people gypsies, but today we refer to that group of population as Roma and Sinti. Um, other shop owners, other people weren't always welcoming to that group that would be considered a minority group. But my mom's dad certainly was and gave them a spot in their in his store to to sell some of their goods. Um, so that was very nice. She, my mom described her family as being friendly with everybody, um, just completely integrated into that town of Sigat, Romania. <clears throat> she was going along. Um, her parents didn't tell her a lot about the world or about any kind of war or anything like that. She really was um, just a happy, somewhat sheltered, um, very comfortable uh, uh, life that she lived, um, going to school, getting together with her friends. Until there was a time that started to happen. Um, she was already almost done with uh, high school. And these very strange laws started coming. Um, she didn't know why, uh, but they did. And one of those laws was that Jewish men couldn't own businesses anymore. And, I mean, where did that come from and why not? But they had to obey the law. So her dad had to close up shop and they didn't have um, his deli, his shop anymore. So think about that. You know, back then there was one person in the family who worked and that was her dad and one income. And her dad was then told, no, you can't work anymore. You can't have your own shop. And that was really hard on him. And sadly, he had a heart attack during that time and he died. So my mom lived with her mother and her aunt, Auntie Sarah, lived in the house with them. And there were two little cousins that Annie Sarah had. <clears throat> and so they went on and life goes on. And she was still going to school and getting together with her friends. And then another law came that said, Jewish girls can't go to school anymore. And she thought, why not? And uh, what is this about? But being law-abiding, they didn't send Jewish girls to school anymore. And she used to tell the students when she spoke, she'd say, you know what? I wasn't that good of a student anyway, so I didn't mind. I stayed home. I practiced my piano. And um, when my girlfriends came home from school, we still went for walks. And that was fine for a while. And then another law came that said, Jewish people can no longer walk on the sidewalks. Now that was a strange one. Wait a minute, what and why not? This is very strange. What I didn't tell you was in this small town in the early 1920s, 1923, so she would have been early 30s, Oh, no, she was older, 40s, because the, the war likely was already getting started. She didn't know this, that there was a war. She just kept getting hit with these very strange laws. What I didn't tell you was, even though um, the town was modern for its time, it was very small and very charming, and they made a lot of their local deliveries and transportation using horses and carriage. Sometimes you go to, like, fancy parks today or down, like I live in Kansas City, downtown, not down, on the plaza in Kansas City. If you visited, there's horse and carriage rides. It was like that. There were horses there. So when she was told you can't walk on the sidewalks anymore, this is why I always ask the younger students when I speak to them, what, what do horses do when they're in the streets? And they walk in the streets all day. What do horses naturally do? 
they poop. And she didn't want to walk in the streets with the poop because she was wearing her nice clothes. And so she said, oh, forget it. I'm just not going to go for walks anymore. And so she stayed home. And there they stayed for a long time, just wondering what is going on. And law upon law kept coming one after the other. And people just took it. And they just, um, they just dealt with it one by one as they came. One time there was a law that said all the Jewish boys and men have to line up and they took them away nobody knows where they took them to at least not you know my mom and the people that were left in town didn't know um ellie was of course was one of them all the men and boys who could go left one time one of the boys returned he must he escaped and he came back to Sigan, and he said you guys are never going to believe this. They took us out, out somewhere, out. And there was this huge, huge, huge pit, giant pit that, that, that was there. And they lined us up along this pit and they shot us in our backs and we fell into the pits. Somehow, I don't know how, this boy um, didn't get shot and didn't get found and he escaped and he came back to his hometown in Siget and he told them that and you know when he said you guys you're not going to believe this you know what they didn't believe him because back then if you think about it it was a different time I'm sorry they didn't have guns it was not commonplace to hear of people being shot on the news they didn't have movies with violence. They didn't have video games. It was a different time. And so to think that innocent people were being lined up and shot for no reason, it was incomprehensible. They didn't understand. They didn't believe him. Time went on. <laughs> and then another law came and it said, people who live in this part of the town have to pick up and move into this part of the town. And they called this part of the town ghetto. And you were not free to come and go. Once you got moved into that part of the town, that was it, you were in there. Well, my mom's house was in this part of town, was in the ghetto. So other people, families, people who were still left, who hadn't been taken previously, moved in to this part of the town. And my mom, they had to open up their house so other people could move in and, and live there in her house. So they dealt with it. One day she went into her living room. I have been in her house and her living room. They called it the salon. It was beautiful. It wasn't just square um, ceiling. It was rounded, it was beautiful, um, light green colored walls. And there was a beautiful hand-woven tapestry that was hanging on the wall. It was like, my mom used to describe that work of art as the talk of the town. It was something really special that her mom was saving for her brother when he graduated from medical school. She wanted that her, her she, my mom's mom wanted that tapestry to hang in her son, the doctor's um, office someday. So, and that's where my mom's grand piano was, and it was just, just beautiful. Well, when they were in the, the, turn this part of the town into the ghetto, you know, what do you do all day? And there's people in your house, and you can't go out. Well, she was going to go practice her piano, and she opened the door to the living room, to the salon, and there was a family living in there, and they had put their pots and pans, stacked them up on her grand piano, and she said, oh, forget it. I'm just not going to practice anymore. So time went on again. A very loud knock, angry knock and yelling came on their door, the front door. And they said, get your things together. We're going to be leaving soon. L leaving where? Leaving how? What? Why? How long? They had no idea. 
So they just had to get some things together. Think about it. You know, like when you pack to go on a trip or vacation or whatever, you have to know where you're going, how many nights you're staying, what's the weather going to be like if you're going to pack. All right. What if you don't have time to like pack clothes and toiletries? What if you were told you were leaving and you don't even know if you're coming back? What would you bring? Does your family have some, I don't know, prized possessions or your most valued things? Or would you even think about bringing something like that? My mom's mom and um, uh, at the time thought, um, uh, I'm, I'm the only thing they thought about bringing was um, a loaf of bread. They had just finished baking some bread. And they thought, well, we'll we'll bring the bread because we don't know where we're going or how long we'll be. That's about it. So they went, the guy came back, knocked on the door, said, come out and line up. And so everybody had to line up in the streets, five abreast, five people standing in a row. And they didn't know where they were going, what they, what was happening. They just had to stand there for a, a long time until everybody lined up. She said it was really a sad, a sad sight, seeing all these people wondering what's going on. Um, you know, most of the men uh, and young boys and boys were gone. There was old, older people, people who weren't in good health and young children um, and women who were left. So in the line they went and then the order came to start walking. And they walked through the town. They didn't know where they were going, but they were being hurried along with angry voices. And they were walking toward the town. And my mom remembered, you know, looking around as they're walking down the streets of the town and all those great memories, you know, walking past the movie theater, walking, all these memories of being with her friends, <laughs> you know, and like it. Sorry, like at Ellie Wiesel's house, uh, Ellie Wiesel's sister's house, hanging out. And here they're walking, walk past her synagogue, walk past her friends' churches, all these memories. They didn't know where they're going. Pace picked up. They were almost being chased now at this point. And they went a long way and they ended up at the train station. Now, when my mom was younger, her mom used to take her on train rides. Um, I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of riding a train in Europe, but um, it's, it's wonderful. And back then it was considered kind of a fancy thing to do. Um, you would dress up and you would go in the train and they would have nice meals. If you had a sleeper car or something like that. Uh, when they got to the train station, um, this was not that kind of train. <clears throat> they were long lines of cattle cars, cattle cars. So they were um, enclosed trains with a door that slid open, no windows except for a little one up at the top. And um, they smelled, it smelled like cattle, like they had delivered cattle not too long ago in them. Well, there were people there shoving them into these cattle cars, and I mean, squished them. There were no chairs in there. There was no bathroom. They just pushed people in, and they were super crowded. Some people had enough room to squat down, sit down on the floor, but um, no, no amenities whatsoever, and they shut the doors, and it was dark, but you could tell she could tell through that little window up at the top, um, you know, when it was light and when it was dark. And they counted two nights and three days on the cattle cars. And those cattle cars just stopped, never stopped rolling. And she said it was um, <laughs> it was tough because they did bring that loaf of bread, but it was my mom her mom and the two little cousins. My mom's auntie Sarah had to stay behind in Siget because she had just had uh, surgery, a hysterectomy, and she wasn't well enough to walk. 
So she stayed behind, but they took the two little cousins um, on the train with them. And those two little cousins gobbled up all of the bread in those two days and three nights. My mom didn't even take any because she wanted the little kids to be able to eat. There were no bathrooms on the train. There was a bucket. And just to give people a little bit of dignity, somebody would hold up a blanket or a coat to give someone some privacy while they use the bucket. But she said it was very sad. There were some old people, uh, maybe people who were already sick, who died. <clears throat> they actually died during that train ride. Well, after two nights and three days on that third day, the cattle cars rolled to a stop. And the doors opened up and it was super bright. They could hardly see. But my mom saw somebody there um, who yelled to them and said, you have just arrived to Auschwitz, but this is a work camp. Now, at that point in time, because I told you she was in high school, she had to stop, and then some time went by in the ghetto and all of that. At that point in time, my mom was 21 years old. And her mom used to tell her, when you are 22, not more than 23, you are supposed to get married and start having a family. And my mom was a romantic. I mean, she I told you about, you know, seeing the boys that she had a crush on. And she was you know, thinking along these lines of someday I'm going to have to have a family. And she was looking forward to that. She never worked a day in her life. But she thought, OK, if this is a work camp, I'm going to work very hard because I need to be 22 and start getting married and have a family, not, not older than 23. And that was her mindset. This was um, um, after her liberation, 50 years after her liberation. In fact, she wanted to go back and see the sites where she actually experience these things. And I said, I'm going with you. And my other sister said, I'm going with you. And in my other sister and my other sister. So there are four girls in our family. <clears throat> and we all said, we are going with you, mom, to look at, you know, the places where you have been. And um, <clears throat> we knew it was something special. So we hired, well, we, we, we hired a, a videographer and we have a video documentary, and I will be so happy to share that link with you um, guys. It's a, it's a, about an hour-long documentary, and some of the photos that I have are from there. So this is might be what it looked like when she got off of the train. That um, brick structure and the tunnel in the middle is where the trains would come through. This is actually the women's side of um, Auschwitz, the women's camp was called Birkenau, and all of the trains came into Birkenau first, and then they started separating people. So my mom jumped off the train, the cattle car, went again, everything was orderly in a line, and she was in the line, you know, rows of people, and they were making their way toward the center um, platform that, what that, was a wooden structure that went up and there was a man standing up there. By the time she got up there, she noticed it was a man in a uniform, a military like uniform, and she said he was very handsome. And so somehow her mind was put at ease thinking, oh, you know, he's a handsome man, he wouldn't hurt us. And so she, her row a point, a, approached this platform. She was in line with, she was her two little cousins and her mom, some other people. <clears throat> this man on the platform was pointing people to go to their left or to their right and didn't say a word, just pointed, motioned. And he motioned my mom to go to her right and the two little cousins and her mom to go to their left. Well, my mom didn't want to separate from them. So she started to go to her left as well 
to be with her mom and the two little cousins. And no sooner there was a soldier on the level of the um, ground where they were who stopped her and put a, um, a long gun, a rifle with a, point, a bayonet, you know, the pointy metal thing right under her because um, she dared to disobey this person on the platform and that scared her. So she started to go to her right. We found out later, she found out later, that man on the platform was the infamous Dr. Mengele. Here, she disobeyed him, so she had to go to her right. Her mom and her two little cousins went to the left, and she never saw them again. When she went to the right, she went through some gates like this. And inside the gates, um, you can't see them today because most of them are gone, but there were wooden barracks. And one of the wooden barracks that they took the girls into, um, there were other girls working in there who had scissors and they started to cut their hair off, like, like off, sh totally, totally short. And my mom used to say, when she gave her talks, she, you know, she looked down. I mean, you saw how pretty she was. She looked down and all her beautiful curls were on the floor. And you know what she said to herself? She said, oh, well, I'll grow more. So that was, that was, uh, that was the first, you know, humiliation. Then they took their clothes and in return gave them these gray, very scratchy dresses, ugly, scratchy dresses. And all the girls now look the same with these ugly dresses and their shaped heads. And they took them into um, another barrack. And there um, they waited for a long time um, before anything happened. My mom, I think you're starting to get a hint of her personality. She was an optimist. So even though um, I'll read this in case anybody is not near their computer and can read a screen. This is a quote from my mother's book. She said, outside the sun was shining. How ironic. It should have been raining, like our hearts inside. But an inner voice told me, do not think, just follow orders. This was the first layer to cover my pain. The cocoon-like layers continued as time went on thicker and thicker layer upon layer. Her beautiful life before with her childhood experiences were safely protected. No one could rob me of that. So she really, with all this scariness and uncertainty around her, she really clung to this beautiful childhood um, and memories that she had. The girls were taken into this barrack. And there was a woman who was in charge of that barrack. It was like a wooden cabin. There were bunk beds in there, but not nice bunk beds. These were just wooden shelves that um, no blankets, no pillows. And the girls had to squeeze in multiple girls per um, shelf. And she said they had to sleep feet to feet, like head to, you know, feet to feet to, to, in order to squeeze people in on the lower and the middle and the upper bunks. And they squeezed in there. And this woman who was in charge started marching up and down the aisles, yelling at these girls saying, well, you've been so comfortable in your homes, in your comfortable beds all these past years. I've been here. I was forced to come here and build this house, build this camp. And it's been horrible. And you are so spoiled. And here I was suffering all these years. She was mad and she was yelling. The girls had no idea what she was talking about. But one of the girls in my mom's cabin said, um, excuse me, but did you have a brother named David? And she just stopped in her tracks. And she said, why, yes, why do you ask? And the girl said, well, when we were in at home in Siget, um, there were some soldiers that came through one time and um, we gave him food and, and, a, and a house to stay in for the night. 
And this woman, it's as though she completely changed her personality. She became what my mom called the guardian angel. She was now very protective of these girls that were in her cabin. When the Nazis would come every so often and um, tell the tell her this this woman um, that um, that the girls had to you know line up and go to work. Um, her name is Giska. She would say, "Nope, not these women. They are sick. They're under quarantine." Now. I'm sorry, I just recovered from COVID like like last month. And so I know, and I know you know what the word quarantine means. You got to stay inside and not be around other people. These girls weren't sick, but Giska was protecting them from doing hard labor because she wanted to protect them as long as she could. So they stayed in those cabins and during the day, they had nothing to do during the days. Um, and so the girls would... Um, See, my mom tried to get them to sing and harmonize. Remember, she loved music so much. She would, uh, you know, get the girls together and sing and harmonize. And then if there was an older girl or a young mother with them still, that um, person would, would share recipes with them. I mean, they weren't given a lot of food. And so to be talking about food was a little bit a little bit difficult, but my mom wanted to learn these recipes. Why? Because she needed to get married and start having a family. So she was training in her mind for that. They were given um, not very much food, um, maybe some um, soup that had some not good things in them, sometimes rocks, sometimes bugs, um, but that, that was what they called soup and a black liquid they called coffee, but she said this was not coffee. What happened after they drank that was all of the girls um, stopped having their periods. And they, uh, my mom said that they just didn't dream anymore. They would sleep sometimes at night, but they never, their minds were changed. They didn't have, um, wasn't restful and they for sure didn't have um, dreams. So Giska protected them as long as they could. But one day, really, um, the order came and said, these girls have to go to work. So um, so, so they did that. Um, I, I just realized my next slide I want to show you before, the, uh, the, before I talk about what her job was. Um, if you had to go to the bathroom, which... People do, even if you aren't eating or drinking much, your body still functions. You couldn't just go anytime you wanted to. Again, you had to line up. And when there were enough girls who needed to go to the bathroom, then they would go as a group. This is what the bathroom looks like. That's my mom 50 years after her liberation and my sisters. And I'm the one in the back on the left. Um, but that's what the bathrooms look like. They were just these slabs of cement with holes in them. And Giska used to say, I don't ever let anybody know if you're sick um like if you have diarrhea or something like that don't tell anyone because if you are sick you are going to end up in that smoke and she pointed outside to this tall chimney that was constantly smoking they had no idea what she was talking about but they knew it was very dangerous um if you were to uh, get sick Another thing that happened during the days, um, periodically, well, no, every day, multiple times a day, they would have roll call and they would have to line up five abreast and get um, uh, counted. At one point, um, there was a call that said, um, is, are there any among you who are artists? And um, a couple of girls raised their hands and they gave them um, pins um, to do tattoos. I don't have one, so I don't know what, you know, what is, you know, the thing that, that you do tattoos with, if it was a needle or whatever. Um, but some girls were, um, and some weren't, but they volunteered anyway. And all of the girls got tattoos on their arm, and they were numbers. 
And my mom used to say, I was so lucky because my girl is an artist and she did really nice, even numbers. You saw some, some people, some survivors, their tattoos, their numbers are huge and crooked and all over the place. And they had to live with that. My mom's was, was very, um, very neat and orderly. Um, and after that, she said, we weren't even a name. They just referred to us by our numbers. And so they would have to go out and do these roll calls, sometimes under the freezing cold, sometimes under the hot sun, depending on the time of year, and, um, and, uh, and, and be counted. What Giska said was once in a while, they do these special roll calls called selections. And she said, you don't ever, ever want to get selected because the people who are selected, we never see them again. And again, the girls didn't know what that meant, but they knew that was scary. You should never get selected. Well, the types of people they were selecting were people who were getting too skinny, people who were getting sick, that kind of thing. My mom was very short. She was a petite lady. And, and um, she was um, already, you know, on the skinny side. And so with the very la low lack of food, um, she lost a lot of weight, a lot, a lot of weight. And she knew she was getting close to being in danger of being selected. One time they got called for a selection. She thought, oh God, this is, this is not good. And she was coming up to her turn. Um, so here's what they used to do. There was one Nazi on this side of whatever, an area that they had to walk across. And then one Nazi on the other side. And the girls would have to strip naked and walk between them. And when the, the two would, you know, check them out. And if they thought they were too skinny, whatever, not useful, they would um, select them away and you'd never see him again. So my mom was coming up with her little skinny legs. They were all naked and it was almost her turn. And there were these two new arrivals, these new women who had come into the camp and they still had their weight on them. And they were twins, they were sisters. And my mom used to describe them as very voluptuous, these two sisters. And when they were getting to the front of the line, my mom said, um, excuse me, could, could you two separate and let me go in between you? And they were like, yeah, sure, whatever. And so the first twin walked in between the two Nazi soldiers. And again, she's very voluptuous. And they were, you know, ah, googly eyes at this naked woman with very attractive women walking between them. And right before she got done walking and her sister began walking these two guys you know soldiers were so amazed that oh my gosh there's two of them my mom snuck through she just ran with her little skinny legs struck snuck through made it to the other side and avoided being selected that day so um on one of those times um when they were um <clears throat> in in uh, waiting not for selection but a roll call some girl came up, snuck up, and said, um, you know, are, are you Alice? And she said, she went by her her middle name back then was Lucy. Are you? And she goes, yeah, that's me. And the girl took her hand and put a little folded piece of paper in her hand and my mom and ran away. My mom looked at it and it said, uh, meet me in the bathhouse, Auntie Sarah. Auntie Sarah. Auntie Sarah was there, I don't know how, figured out that mom was in another um, barrack, and truly, they met up, and it was such an amazing feeling for my mom to find her beloved Santi Auntie Sarah. She was like a second mom to her, and so just knowing that she was there was really something. I had mentioned bathhouse. Once in a while, They were taken into a bathhouse. It was like a big, gray, empty um, room, cement walls, no windows, um, some shower heads, and a little water would sprinkle out. They would crowd underneath, and 
they would just get little sprinkles of water once in a while they would throw some little soaps at them that were very strange my mom said that was weird so but anyway she said it felt good once in a while to get sprinkled and that's about as clean as they were allowed to get one time they went into one of those bathhouses and the water never turned on. They waited and waited and waited. And then water never turned on. And one girl started to cry. And the other girl said, what, why are you crying? What do you, what, what do you know? And the girl said, I heard that sometimes water didn't come out, but gas did. And then everybody died. That scared them. That scared the girls. So they all pulled up against the wall and started crying. And they were in there for some time. And a man came in, opened the door and said, what's the matter? And one of the girls said, we don't want to take a shower today. And the guy closed the door and left. And he came back and he handed them back their dresses. And they got dressed and went back to their cabins. Later, um, when we did this journey with my mom, we asked a historian, you know, we told, you know, mom told them that story that that had happened. And the historian said, yeah, interestingly, a um, couple things. The Germans were, uh, the Nazis were superstitious. And if they knew that someone knew that they were going to be killed, they sometimes didn't do it. There was some superstition there. The other thing was probably a more practical explanation was the Nazis were so far outnumbered by the numbers of people who were held in those camps. And in fact, they put so many Jewish people themselves in charge. So Giska, you know, she was Jewish. She was not a Nazi. So um, um, and so if somebody knows that they are about to be killed, they can sometimes, you know, they're desperate. They would do just about anything. And the Nazis were afraid of a revolt because they were so far outnumbered. In this case, the girls knew or suspected that they would be killed. And so they didn't go through with it. They went, the girls went back to the cabin and that was that. But, you know, time went on and conditions were so bad. Um, this was you know, 50 years after her liberation. And it looks like she's touching the fence, but she's not touching the fence. My mom could not bring herself to touch the fence because back then um, it was electrical barbed wire fences and you touch it and you would instantly be electrocuted, scorched to death. And she said, truly, um, she saw some girls do that. They just did not want to go on anymore. What was life worth living for when they were treated like animals. And she said, remember when she said this, this line really struck with me. She said, there was never a time during the day where you felt safe, day or night. You just, you never felt safe. You always felt like you were either going to be killed or something bad was going to happen. Um, and that was really scary. So it's no wonder that some girls uh, did this. Um, but they had to walk, the, the girls in her cabin, when they came to take them away for work, they had to walk between, um, like in that first um, uh, slide I showed you with the gates opening, and then these rows of these um, barbed wire fences and the fence posts, they had to walk between those, a pathway, like a um, sidewalk, but it wasn't paved, a long way to get to their, where they worked. Where they worked was in a, like a warehouse. They called it Canada. The historian told us that it was called Canada because um, it was called the land of plenty. Like Canada, that used to be like a slogan of theirs, the land of plenty. Here, what they meant was this is the one that she worked in was where um, the clothing that was taken from the people coming off of the train, where all that um, clothing was being stored. This happens to be a pile of shoes that were taken from um, people when they got off the train. This part, this picture was taken in Auschwitz, the men's side of the camp where they <clears throat> turned part of it into a museum. And you can see these um, 
shoes and they're stacked up to the ceiling. And of course, this is just a sample of, of what was there. Um, there were stacks of eyeglasses, stacks of, I mean, everything you could imagine that humans, people came wearing or carrying with them, um, got into these um, stores. Well, the one that my mom worked in was, um, and, and the girls in her cabin, <clears throat> they had clothing. So like her clothes, when they were taken off um, and they were handed those gunny sack dress, those burlap dresses, <clears throat> it was those clothes. And what the girls had to do with dull scissors, they had to cut up clothing into strips, long strips of clothing, and they had to braid them and then roll them up into these balls of braided fabric. And they were told that the Germans were, the German military was using those long braided fabric um, as fuses to light their bombs. So she's cutting along and once in a while, her scissors would hit something. Remember when we talked about, you know, when they had to line up out of their hometown and they didn't know where they were going or what to bring, they had 15 minutes to prepare. Well, some people brought some of their valuables and put them in their pockets. Some people sold things into the hems of their pants or their dresses. Um, in her book, my mom talks about a few of the things that she found. One was like a little spoon, probably either a baby spoon or one that you get when you see those when you go uh, visit a place and tourists buy those little spoons, those little fancy spoons. I don't know why that really um, kind of tickled her. So she um, she liked that spoon and she kept it. If anybody would have ever found her with it, she would have been punished for sure. But she managed to hold on to that spoon. She found some paper money one time and she folded it up and put it in her mouth. <laughs> I don't know how long that lasted. But one of the times they were working and um, one of the girls screamed and started crying. And they said, what, what is the matter? And the, the, the woman said, as she was cutting through this particular clothing, she recognized that it was Giska's dress. Her, their guardian angel, she got found out that she had been protecting these women. And so they killed her. The Nazis killed her. And here they were cutting up her. That was really sad. That was very, very sad. So time went on. Um, they did not um, uh, have anyone there to protect them anymore. More and more rumors about these um, chimneys that were constantly smoking. Eventually they put two and two together that, remember that um, shower that they were in at, that the one woman said, Sometimes gas comes out. Those were that was a gas chamber, and what happened was they would turn on the gas. All the people inside a gas chamber would die, and then um, their bodies were then transferred into ovens to be burned. And they went up into those long um, chimneys that were constantly smoking. And you know, sadly, um, that was what happened to my mom's mom and the two little cousins and everybody else who came off of those trains and, and, and were sent in the direction of the gas chambers. This was 50 years later in the museum part of Auschwitz looking at um, the ovens and, you know, just imagine what my mom was thinking. little cousins. But here again, she said, as long as the sun was shining and we got to see the blue sky, even though the heat was unbearable in those summer months, I was content. My hope for survival was still strong. I tried to inspire others to feel the same. Oh, how I wish this traumatic period of my life would end and that I would be able to get married and raise a family on my own. So now it became winter. We're talking about winter, January 1945. So this was nearing the end of the war. In fact, the Russian front was starting to come in on toward Auschwitz and um, 
the Nazis did not want anybody to see the evidence of what was going on there. Um, there were a few people who um, were in hospitals at the time within Auschwitz and they couldn't flee, but everyone else, again, line up. And this time they walked them outside of the gates of Auschwitz. You know those gates that say, Arbach mach frei, work makes free? Well, they walked underneath those gates in a big crowd, row upon row, out of the gates of Auschwitz and walked and walked and walked again for so long. They, they passed um, farmhouses and were walking through these areas. They, they slept one night on the walk. My mom barely had any soles on her shoes left, but she said that she was in better shape than others. Um, there was, um, it was very dangerous um, because if you didn't keep up, they would shoot you. And so again, my mom was very small, very, very skinny at this point, but she thought, darn it, I have to survive this. Um, and so she made up these little games with herself to try and survive this that they called the death march. This was the same death march that Anne Frank and her sister Margot were on, Corey Ten Boom, other people um, who were in Auschwitz late uh, in those late uh, years, 1944, 1945, and had to be moved out of Auschwitz so that they would not be discovered by the Russians who were coming to liberate Auschwitz. So they walked and walked and they ended up at another railroad and again put onto cattle cars, but these cattle cars were different. These weren't enclosed, they were open bedded cattle cars. And into the cattle cars they went and again, three days, two nights, it's always seemed to be the time frame for her. Um, but the, um, they woke, the girls woke up one morning, having been in that sleeping in the open cattle car, and it had snowed during the night. And remember that little spoon? My mom took that spoon that she had with her, and she just started to eat the snow off of her. And she said it was really good. It gave her just enough, a little bit of water, because they weren't feeding them. No, no food, no water. And the, the cattle cars went, and then they eventually stopped at another concentration camp, another camp called um, Bergen-Belsen. And this camp was deep in Germany. And what we learned later, we had seen maps uh, during our trip, and there were hundreds of sub camps and all around um, the area in Poland and Germany and whatnot that all trains were leading toward um, Bergen-Belsen at that point so that they could centralize as many of the survivors as possible so as not to be um, discovered when, as they, because they knew they were losing the war at that point and they wanted to hide the evidence. So I met with a historian at Bergen-Belsen and he said, what do you do if you are a German operative and you're trying to figure this out? You want to kill as many people as possible. How do you do that? There was no killing. There were no gas chambers. There was no crematory at Bergen-Belsen. How do we kill mass numbers of people? So what they did was stopped feeding them almost all together, no water, and let their hair grow. And then um, lice came, and lice is a bad um, spreader of diseases. So some of the girls got typhus, some got, um, what's the one you do, TB, tuberculosis. Um, and so it, it would really, honestly, people were dropping like flies. My mom was so, so skinny at this point. Once in a while, they would throw into their barrack a like a turnip about the size of an apple to share with the whole group of girls. But my mom's um, teeth, if you know anything about nutrition, if you are very malnourished, um, the gums and the bones that support your teeth just start to become, go away. And so her teeth had no more support. She said they just wobbled in her head. She couldn't bite into the 
turnip that they were supposed to share. So she just said, oh, forget it and let the other girls have it. And girls were dying every day. They would drag the dead ones out and stack them out in front of their window. And then she said, we couldn't even reach that high anymore. And it was blocking out the sun. It just kept dying. They kept dying. And so then they stopped um they stopped taking them out and they just lived in there amongst the dead bodies. My mom was very, very sick at that point, um, very malnourished. And at one point she laid down and she fell asleep. There was a falling asleep and she said, you know what? Nothing hurts. Nothing's worrying me. I feel at peace. And she said, I wonder if this is what death feels like. And she was at peace. And then the door opened. She, there was shooting, there was yelling outside. The door flung open. And then the guy peeked his head in and he had a beret on his head. And she hadn't seen that before. And he closed the door again. And her first thought was, who dares to wake me up from this very peaceful nap I was having? And the guy came back and he lifted her head and he had a thermos and he gave her a sip and it was hot chocolate. <laughs> My mother loved chocolate more than anything. And this, I mean, what an act of kindness. She had not experienced any kind of respect or caring or act of kindness for anyone for almost a year. This was April of 1945. She was taken April of 1944, and it turns out that he spoke English. And do you remember my mom took English lessons? She she understood. Now, she can't tell the difference. She couldn't tell the difference between British English or Australian English or American, but he spoke English, and he said, we are your liberators. And truly, that was the end of it. Um, Many girls um, who could still walk raided the kitchens at night and ate so much food and their bodies were couldn't handle it because they had been starved for so long. And a lot of them died then, um, right after um, liberation. And sadly, in Bergen-Belsen, that's when um, Anne Frank died. Um, Anne Frank's sister Margot died. So many people died in Bergen-Belsen. And so sad. That's when Auntie Sarah died. It was like days before her husband came to rescue her. It's like, darn it. So my mom survived. I don't know how. She's, she was 22, 21 years old. 22 years old. She weighed 47 pounds, 47 pounds, 22 years. Old. She said, my legs were like skeletons. Um, she couldn't stand, she couldn't walk. She was embarrassed with how skinny she looked. She looked like those pictures you see, walking skeletons. Um, she, uh, they came, they said, you know, where did, where did you live? Where do you want to go? And she said, I want to go back home. And her friend said, Look at yourself. You can't even walk. You have to go get better first and, and then go back home. And so there were ambulance drivers there. And that's what that beret was. Um, later, we found out that this was um, the American Field Service, who were ambulance drivers in World War I and World War II, who were helping the British um, to liberate Brigham Belson. And then one week later, the American troops came and help with the effort. And they established a displaced person camp right there. Um, I know some survivors actually who um, who were born in the DB camp. Um, crazy. And but my mom, because she was so sick, the they took her on with the ambulances and took her to Sweden. And there they made um, makeshift hospitals out of schools and churches and that kind of thing. I used to hear my mom say makeshift hospital, and I, that term never really sunk in until, I don't know if you remember during COVID, before we really knew what was going on, and we were filling up hospitals, and then I heard on the news, they said, oh, they, they're turning this 
um, center into a makeshift hospital or this school was like, oh my gosh, that is, it was like a makeshift hospital. And that's where my mom went until she got a little bit better. She could go to um, a rehabilitation place for, for Jewish women. And there um, they sent in one man, a photographer, and he was uh, taking pictures because they wanted to, you know, how do you reunite families? They didn't have internet. But the Red Cross um, really helped with an uh, effort to um, reunite survivors with their families. People got dispersed all over the world, South America and all over Europe and every place. And so um, he was allowed to come in, the only man to allowed to come in. Well, my mom, it took her a long time to actually even learn to walk again. Um, they were very kind. The Swed Swedish people were so kind to her and, and the people there. She was a picky eater before she went into the concentration camp. She was a picky eater afterwards. She would just pick at her food or she wouldn't eat something she didn't like. And that ended up being the best thing for her. She didn't overload her system. Um, she was able to build her weight back, grow her beautiful curls back. But do you know what got her out of bed finally one day to, to be able to really try to walk when she laid in her bed in a, a certain position she could look down the hall down the hall there was another room it was like the social hall this room and when its door was open she could see there was a piano in there <laughs> and she wanted to go play the piano so she worked on walking she got to where she could walk and then she went in there and played the piano so it was um, during those times where she went for a walk with um, a friend of hers. And this man, the photographer, um, was going for a walk with them. The girl stood in, the friend stood in the middle because my dad spoke German, my mom spoke Hungarian, the woman spoke both. And so my mom and dad would have a conversation through this woman and they would go on these walks in the gardens in the evening. And one of those nights, my dad said, uh, I could spend the rest of my life with you. And my mom answered back, spend the rest of my life with you too. <laughs> they got married. And um, my mom learned um, German to speak with my dad. And the both of them learned Swedish to, um, uh, to live in Sweden. And they um, lived with a like a foster family, the nicest people that they, um, they helped them and then they um, uh, helped them to get sponsored to move to the United States. And <clears throat> there weren't, you know, I guess you would call them sanctuary cities. That's one of the labels that's given today. You couldn't just go anywhere you wanted to in the United States. It had to be a city that was accepting refugees and it was only a certain number that they would let in. Well, my parents, my dad's brother had made it a few, a two, couple years prior. And so he was the sponsor. And so my mom and dad were able to be sponsored and come to um, America. And they ended up in the Pacific Northwest, um, first in this little town called Kelso, Washington, which was just across the river from Portland. And so they ended up um, ended up in Portland, Oregon. So now new country, neither one of them ever had an opportunity to go to college. They had to learn the language. They had to get jobs. They um, had to do this uh, in, during this time. My mom was 23 years old. She had been told by doctors early on that she would never be able to have children because of um, how much weight she had lost and other damage that she had sustained. But guess what? My first sister was born in 1950. And then two more came, 1956 and 55 and 56. And then I came in 1962. And we went back with my mom to visit her hometown in um, Sigat, Romania. This is inside of the synagogue. Her synagogue was beautiful inside. But if you look on the ceiling on the upper right, you can see a break in the ceiling and birds were coming in and out from in there. The synagogue's not used anymore. Not enough Jewish people survived. I think it was out of 2,000 
Um, people, Jewish people that lived in the town, only 200 survived, and of those, only a few came back to live. But we visited in 50 years later after her liberation, and we found her piano teacher. <laughs> oh my gosh, this woman and her husband did not speak a lick of English, but boy, did we have a great time with them. She played the piano and we danced and her husband was pouring us shots of vodka. <laughs> we had just a really happy time because, um, you know, my mom survived and had children and this was not in Hitler's plans this is what he did not want to do so I'm going to fast forward many years after this my mom led an effort actually in two cities now um, she did this but this is the one in Portland Oregon she got the survivors together and she said we are not here to cry we are here to leave a legacy we have to educate future generations so this is the Holocaust Memorial in Portland, Oregon's Washington Park. It is beautiful. If any of you ever have a chance to visit Oregon, Portland, this is there for everyone to read about the history, to, um, to, to see the uh, memorial. Um, it's, it's just really something. And, and here's kind of a coincidence. She ended up in Portland, Oregon. Do you remember that picture of her in the school play? She was the Red Rose. Roses are her favorite flower. Portland is known as the city of roses. I think we have some time for some questions. If you wanna open it up for uh, questions, that would be wonderful. Okay, um, let's see here. Let me get myself on there. I did it, hold on. Where am I? You start talking about you're on there. Okay. Um, I don't see myself. Can I am I visible, Doctor? Yeah, we can see you. Okay. I guess I must just have too much stuff on the screen. Well, I let me just say, wow, I mean, it's such a powerful story. Um we again have some time. We have the chat open uh so people can uh submit questions. And uh I think you can see them too. Would you uh, see. want me to read them or just as they come yeah, in? Yeah, that'd be great. Because we want to read them so other people can. So uh, I'll start off while people are thinking about what they might want to ask. And uh, actually, I have two or three, but I don't want to steal people's thunder. But I would like to start off myself asking you something most people probably won't ask. And it really has to do. Oh, there. I, I see myself now. Um, let me fix this picture here. So I'm OK. That looks better. Um your story, I mean, in terms of uh, the story of growing up with a mother as a Holocaust survivor, I mean, what kind of a um, effect did that have on you and uh, and all that? I mean, that must be a, yeah. an interesting That's a, that excellent question. Um, and if you asked each of my sisters the question, we all have a different answer. So if you can imagine my oldest sister... Um, she was um, born two years after they emigrated to the U.S., 1948. She was born in 1950. They were still learning the language. They were still learning the culture. They were still recovering from the trauma. My dad was in Dachau um, as well. So her, her interpretation of what it felt like was very different than mine. I am 12 years um, younger than my oldest sister. By the time they had me, they had already had three girls. They'd already been through grade school. I mean, they were old hat at being, you know, American parents. Um, but we always knew something was different. First of all, our parents spoke with thick accents. Um, we had different um, kinds of foods than my friends did, different traditions. But this is, to my mother's credit, um, she was always very age appropriate with us. She never um told us what happened she didn't scare us um, with stories intentionally or unintentionally and there is something called second generation syndrome that some other children of survivors have experienced and that's when their parents talked about it too much when they were young and growing up 
and the their kids don't want to have anything to do with it. I knew many survivors in Portland whose kids didn't come to the meetings. They just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I, and I can understand that, but our mom was not that way. She was, very, in fact, she was very funny when my oldest sister was little and she said, mom, what are those numbers on your arm? My mom said, oh, those? don't worry about that. That's just Hitler's phone number. I make a joke about it. So always very age appropriate. It wasn't until her book, was published in um, 1988, and I was in dental school. My sisters were already out of college and had kids of their own that we read the book, and we're like, oh my gosh, those details, and we that explained a lot. We just didn't know that, and it was good that she didn't share those with us growing up, so very, very good. Um, I can see the chat and I and I can see it now. And I am so sorry that I did not share. Let's see, I don't know how to do that. When you share your slides full screen. Um, so I think you were just looking at a smaller version of it, but somebody asked the question right there, what are those words on the wall? And I, I don't know if any of you speak German, but that's, um, German for pretty much you stay silent. You need to stay silent. But the way my mom said it was, it was kind of a, in a rude kind of a way, almost like, you know, a, an angry way. It wasn't a, a kind way of saying, um, of saying that. More questions, please ask me anything. Are you able to see questions at your end? Or do I'm going to uh, open my chat again and see. Uh, In the restrooms, that was the restrooms. Okay. And the slideshow, those are the only two that I see. Are there more? Is there a reason you don't share your dad's story? Yeah, time. So if you want to hear a synopsis, because um, I want to be respectful of your time, I think we have 10 minutes. Is that right, Mike? Well, we have as long as you want to take, because I mean, if people <laughs> feel they have to log out, they'll log out. So, so sure. Uh, you know, we're sure. really very quickly. My dad, my dad, not my grandfather. This is how our generations are so off. My dad was born in 1909. 1909. His dad was killed in World War One, fighting on the Austro-Hungarian side, because it was called the Austro-Hungarian Empire back then. And my dad, and the, he was born in what's now a small town outside of Vienna, Austria. So that's why German was his first language. And um, so his dad died when he was um, taken, when he, when he was um, still young, and he had a brother and a sister and their mom. Well, their mom could not raise three kids on her own with the dad gone. And so, she, you know, tough decision, but she kept the daughter and sent the two brothers, my dad and his brother, to an orphanage in Czechoslovakia. And um, he was there all through his, you know, middle school, high school years. And when he aged out, that's when he moved back to Vienna and got his first job and was really enjoying his um, his life. But his mom in their small time out town outside of Vienna had um, cataracts and needed to have surgery. And so she called him back from Vienna and said, you have to stay home and run the store. They had a little grocery store. And so that's what he had to do. And he was there. Well, that's when I mean, he didn't know what was going on. Well, no, he did. He was a little more in tune than my mom was. He paid attention when there was this man who was coming to power, who was running, you know, was a, a democratically elected election, and it was pre-election season, and this man came came on the scene, and he he, he was very patriotic and forceful when he spoke. And his name was Adolf Hitler. And his slogan, one of the things he said was, make Germany great again. 
because they had lost after World War I and now it was approaching, you know, in between the wars and they had depression and they had terrible economic problems. And my dad was like, yeah, yeah, we should make Germany great again. I would vote for him. So <laughs> we don't have time to go into the history. I'm no historian, that's for certain. But it was on the night of Kristallnacht, which was the night of broken glass, which was government-sponsored um, destruction of Jewish businesses, where people were taking bats and sticks and rocks and breaking windows of Jewish-owned businesses. And there was broken glass all over. It looked like broken crystal all over the ground. And that's why it's called Kristallnacht. That night, my, my dad in that little town outside of Vienna, they rounded up all the guys and made them go to their train station. I've been to the train station. It's so quaint. It is so such a beautiful little hilly town. And in that, and, and the train was there waiting for them. And each one had to go up into the train. They didn't know where they were going. They just had to go in there. They'd step up on the train. And there were these two guys dressed like, you know, Nazi soldiers. And um, they would go up there. And the first guy would punch the guys in the stomach really hard and then go make him sit down. And there was my dad coming. And he was about to be punched. And the other guy dressed in Nazi clothes said, oh, no, no, not this one. Um, he's nice. He's really nice. Um, if all Jews were like him, we would have, we would not have this problem. What problem? And anyway, it turns out that that guy was my dad's best friend. He had no idea he had joined the Hitler Youth and then had joined the Nazi party. And now he had these orders to round up all the Jewish people guys and stick them on trains and he ended up in um uh Dachau but it was very early on and so then if um you could prove it was like a political they didn't know the Nazis didn't know quite yet what to do with the prisoners in Dachau very early on 1938 and if you could prove that you had work outside the country they'd let you go and his brother was married at the time so his sister-in-law got them jobs outside of the country. And my dad, she got him a job in Sweden on a dairy farm, milking cows on a dairy farm. So my dad spent the rest of World War II years and the Holocaust in Sweden, peacefully milking dairy cows, listening to the war, the war on uh, BBC radio. But then that call came, are there any Jewish photographers in the area? <laughs> and that was my dad. So um, I'm, I'm wondering if we're getting different uh, questions because I have a couple new ones that have come here and they're different than the ones we're seeing up here. Anyway, uh, one I have here is a two parter from Tissa. The first part uh, is where she says this was great. How in the world were you able to find photos? That is my favorite question. I, my, my girlfriend just asked me this. We had coffee the other day and she asked me the same thing how in the world did you find photos? Because we, on this trip that we took with the videographer, we back, went back 50 years later, we found my mom's house. And we actually, the guy who's living in it was like the umpteenth owner since the forties, but he was scared. He thought maybe we wanted to have the house back. We don't want the house back. I just want to show my daughters, you know, things where things were in the house. So that's how I've been inside her salon. But they lost everything, everything. So where do you get photos? Well, I'm a mom now myself. And what do I do about 10 times a day? I send photos of my son to my friends and to my sisters. And so my mom didn't know this was happening at the time. They, of course, they didn't have cell phones. She was mailing photos to her friends, some of whom had emigrated to the United States before the war. So when my mom finally got reunited with people, and this was decades later, and she shared with them that she's, she's, she's going to have a book of her memories of her childhood, her friend said, oh, do you want some photos? <laughs> Your mom sent me photos. <laughs> Proud mom taking pictures and sharing them with her friends. Amazing. Good question. 
And the second part of Tissa's is, is a comment question. Let me see here. She says it would have been so easy to hate, yet your mother's optimism remained intact. Yeah. It did, but not always. Immediately afterward, she was very angry. She lost everything and everybody she thought at the time. It was my dad. He's always had a very peaceful, um, optimistic personality. And he told her, he said, if you have hate inside of you, if you are angry, it will end up eating you inside. It will hurt you. And she said, okay. <laughs> so she got busy and distracted raising four little girls in a new country, had to learn everything. She didn't really have a whole lot of time to think about things. Um, she did have nightmares. She didn't talk about things during the day, but at night we all witnessed her having nightmares. Sometimes she would yell out at night. Sometimes she would cry, but, um, but that was it. And she didn't really talk about her story until her book was published. And then she found her voice and she never wrote her, uh, she never intended to write a book. She wanted to just hold on to her wonderful memories of her childhood. And when she was new in this country and learning the language, she was listening to the radio. And it said, um, if you have something that's bothering you, take a piece of paper and a pen and just write it down. And so she started writing her memories of her happy memories so she didn't want to forget. And other kids, when you know their parents would come in and watch them at their ballet lessons or piano lessons, like we all had, um, she didn't come in. She stayed in the car and she wrote on these the stack of paper and she just stuck them behind her seat. And we know those were mom's papers and you don't touch them and that's fine. Fast forward many years, um, she was retired and living in Southern California in Palm Springs and she was at a luncheon. And a man sitting next to her saw her tattoo and said, Alice, could you tell me what it's like inside the concentration camp? And she said, oh, well, I don't really talk about it, but um, I wrote it down in my papers if you want to read them. And he said, I would love to read them. And after a week, he called her up and he said, Alice, I am a priest. He was a priest. He had his own congregation. He said, but I'm also a publisher and I'm going to make you a book. And that's where the book came from. Uh, our next one that I have on my end is from a gentleman named Eric. And he actually uh, asked part of the question that you just answered. It says, does your mother ever speak of forgiveness or how she was able to move past any of this? Well, you kind of answered the second part, but yeah. what about the whole idea of forgiveness. Yeah. And, and she would sometimes get this question too um, from the kids that she spoke to so many high schools and colleges and churches and book clubs. She spoke, once that book was published, she found her voice and she just shared her story with anyone who would listen. And she would say, I don't hate Germans um, because most Germans um, didn't necessarily agree with what Hitler was saying, but um, the many Nazis did, but that was a smaller subset of the German population. And she used to say, you know, those who committed crimes, they should pay. But common German people, they had to go along with it too, otherwise their life was in danger. In danger. You've heard of stories that you know, someone hid a family, but they got discovered and they were taken to a concentration camp themselves. So no, she did not. She did not hate. Another question that the kids would often ask her is, um, do you still believe in God? And she used to say, yeah, yeah, I still believe in God. But if I ever get a chance to meet him, I sure have a lot of questions. So yeah, she was she was an optimist. She saw the good in people. Um, that's actually so far in my list, the last question. I have a couple of requests, which we can address at the end as far as availability of the recording that we're making. Um, but can you see the one that asks about you returning to Germany? Is that yeah, 
Yeah. yeah so during this um, trip, 50 years after my mom's liberation, um, we did, we, we returned and we did a reverse order of her experiences because um, just of logistics. So the first place we landed was in Germany and we made our way to Bergen-Belsen um, concentration camp. And there, um, there aren't many structures, a wonderful museum and a wonderful historian that we had such a good time with. But they had to burn down the wooden structures um, upon liberation because they were so infested with disease um, that uh, they had to, with flamethrowers, they just, the um, liberators, um, German, um, British and then American, plus the American Field Service ambulance drivers had to burn down those. But you know what remains, um, despite not being um, many structures, mass graves. Remember I mentioned the historian was conjecturing if you were a Nazi and trying to figure out the logistics, how do you mass murder thousands of people? And they were successful and buried the, upon liberation then um, they built um, built these, they filled these, dug these humongous pits like the size of football fields and filled them with dead bodies, covered them up in their mounds um, all over. There's several of them around Bergen-Belsen. <clears throat> and um, there's these cement kind of, I guess they'd be like a giant headstone that says, here lies 1500, here's lies, you know, whatever the number of bodies that were in there. Um, so, so yeah, so we went back to Germany there. Um, then we went to Auschwitz. So we took a train to um, Poland and um, went to Auschwitz. And there we stayed in a convent, Carmelite nuns. Their, their convent used to be on the grounds of Auschwitz. There was some controversy. They moved and their, um, their building, their structure is now just outside the gates of Auschwitz. And it's lovely. And the Polish girls who worked there under Father Peter was the person who was there when we were visited. Um, he was training them to, to, you know, to be able to have jobs of their own. And it was lovely staying there. And after a <clears throat> busy day of filming, um, my mom would go to bed and my sisters and I would stay up with the videographer and uh, we would drink wine and we would plan the next day's route and what part of the video, the documentary that he would have mom talk about. And one thing about my sisters and me, when we got get together, even today, when we get together, we laugh and laugh there's just always something so funny and we're always laughing and one night father peter came up and he said i just have to ask you this how can you be on the gates of auschwitz here and laughing and my oldest sister said oh that's an easy one my mom wasn't supposed to have children i mean she was so emaciated she was told she would never have kids and here we are she used to think of us as her revenge our revenge against Hitler. We were. She wasn't supposed to survive, let alone have girls who went on to have babies. They were, that was not supposed to happen. So, um, you know, my mom and dad went on to live a very happy life, and um, and so, um, yeah, she was an eternal optimist. Um, and we did visit, and then the last place we stopped were the pictures I showed you from her hometown, and she was so happy. So happy to be there to visit it once again. Thanks for the question. Uh, do you want to spend just a couple more questions before we go? And guys, if you need to drop off, that's fine too. Okay, well, the, the reason I have a question which I can ask or uh, while we wait for a couple more, but I just wanted to point out without using anybody's name, I see at least two history majors among our guests, and they're certainly free to take advantage of this situation and uh, ask Dr. Crane some questions. Uh, no I am not a historian, no my mom. Intended, but while they're thinking about what they want to do, or other people too, uh, yeah. since uh, this will be the last opportunity to do so. Yeah. You remember in the introduction, I had talked about we had ordered a, a copy of your mom's book, and it ended up that it was autographed by her. 
I, I was wondering what you thought about that, because I'm guessing she must have done some signings and somehow that made it onto the yeah. Amazon.com market. Yeah, I am so glad that you found that. Yes, she would do a talk like this. Of course, back then it was always live and it was a packed high school auditorium or university or whatever. And then there were long lines to uh, buy a book and have her sign it. And and she always just said, you know, I just would love it if you read it, but if you share it with others, I would love that. And so, um, you know, over the years, students probably bought them, wrote, they wrote their reports or did whatever they had to do, or just people who heard her and then clean up house and sell it on Amazon, which is exactly what my mom would have wanted. She wanted other people to read her stories. So, but the signed ones, those are hard to find. Once in a while, my sisters and I go on to Amazon to see if we can find some that are signed. Um, so yeah, that's that's really great that you have one. That's great. And and like I said, I'll <clears throat> share the um MP4 um link with you. I don't know if you if your library has uh, those kinds of um, resources that are available, but um share, share it however you would like. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, there are a couple of people who more so than questions, I guess they're in the form of questions, but they were basically asking, make sure we provide the link to the documentary and where can we get it? And so just to let folks know, again, I'm still waiting for a couple more questions, you guys. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> but the plan is, you know, Dr. Crane has generously allowed us to record this. And uh, I don't know how long we'll have it on the Kansas Wesleyan webpage. And again, I'm not even clear if it'll be in the history department page or not, but this recording tonight will be available for a brief while. And then the recording you're talking about is actually the testimony the video. Yeah. Mom from the uh, Midwest Center for Holocaust Education uh, survivors videos. Is that correct? That's well, the, we, we produced it. That. it in 1995 is when we went back and I wasn't living in Kansas City yet, but um, honestly, it was a VCR when we produced it. And so since then, it's been turned into an MP4 um, and it's just under an hour. And it's it's this. This was what you um, it, the the slides that I showed you um, were from there, from the video. And it's my mom telling her story, but on site. And she always thought of the um, video documentary as a supplement to the book because she was able to go into greater detail in the book. And then the video kind of hits some of those high points, but it's nice because she's telling the story from the very location where it happened. So you've got that visual more than we did in the book. And, and then let me tell you this, um, both students and and um, Mike as well. If you have questions afterwards, you know you know how to reach me via email, either compile questions or share my email address. That's fine too. I'm no historian. I am. My mom used to say, "I'm not a historian. I'm not an educator." Well, I'm not a historian. I kind of am an educator, but it's about dentistry. So you know, I'm not a Holocaust educator. But um, I am completely open to answering any questions that you might have, even if you think of them later. Well, OK, I also want to point out uh, we also have at least two administrators who are probably just busting at the seams to ask a question. But uh, while we give them one or two more minutes to do that, um, I was just going to ask, too. Uh, so you've gone from being a dentist to being an administrator at a dental school, do you still uh, uh, torture people in the chair at all? Or is that kind of past you? Or do you still- <clears throat> First of all, I never tortured people I'm in joking. the chair. I know, I know. But in um, 1999, I was practicing almost 10 years and I got a herniated disc in my neck and my doc said, no more practice for you. So, you know, that, that I worked for and trained for a, a you know, all my adult life, a young adult, but at that point, um, I couldn't do anymore. And so I did, I started um, teaching in the dental school, but I did what any reasonable girl would do. And I went back and got my PhD <laughs> in, um, um, in more in organiz organizational development and change, managing change. And so um, I've applied that uh, to my administrative positions in dental education um, ever since. And I got that 
PhD from UMKC here in Kansas City in 2010, um, because that's where my husband lived lived at the time. And so I moved here and we had our first, our baby, who's now 16, um, while I was in the PhD program. Well, I think that's really cool. I don't know if people realize, I mean, one doctorate is hard enough, but to get two, that's very impressive. Yeah, my Uh, husband calls me a paradox. Get it? Paradox. Uh, So um, I see one question about um, if I visited the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and I have, and I visited it there with my mother, and that was wonderful, just wonderful. She was there at the groundbreaking of the museum and at their 10-year anniversary. And Ellie Wiesel was the spokesperson at um, the at, at tenure, and Mom would run into him over the years on occasion. It was just very cute <laughs> when they got together and spoke Hungarian to each other. I actually am happy to announce that one of uh, my history majors actually has a question that uh, came in on mine, and it says, "Did your mom keep the spoon you spoke about?" This is Caitlin. Uh, do you know where it is? I'm wondering if it became a sort of heirloom. Don't know where the spoon ended up. I don't know where the spoon ended up. I don't know what happened to those paper monies that she had in her mouth. Um, I know she had a um, lipstick container. You know, like, I don't know if you've seen, you know, you buy lipstick, but then there's sometimes these jeweled metal tubes that you can put your lipstick in she I did remember that because um she she used to keep that in her bathroom when I was a little girl I'd sneak into her bathroom and sit in front of the mirror and pretend like I was dressing up and I remember that jeweled case in there but that is something I'm gonna have to ask my sisters and see if they knew anything about what happened to the spoon good question um any more come in at your end I don't have any more. No, I had a thank you for sharing. And um, and I do. I thank you all for attending. This is what my mom would say at this point. She would say, thank you so much for your interest in this topic, for listening, and for letting the stories continue. Because as you know, you know, there's not many survivors left. And now it's up to our next generation's my generation, my sons, and onward to keep telling these stories. It's one thing to read about it in history, especially if you're in middle school and high school, you tend to think of history as happening a long time ago, far, far away. But it's, there are stories of, they're real stories of real lives. And I think that among those stories, the lessons from history can be learned and like my mom used to say because you never want it to happen again to anyone I was talking to my sister the other day and I don't know if you know this maybe you do that it was recently Yom HaShoah which is Holocaust Remembrance um and my mom my sister was in Portland and and part of a um commemoration where she, um, it, for Yom HaShoah, and one of the rabbis there said, it's one thing to say never again, because that's an amazing sentiment that we all should aspire to, he said, but aspiring to something is different than achieving it. And so we say never again, but what we really need to do is turn that into action and make sure that the things that lead up to genocide um, don't get started in the first place. When I talk to the younger crowd, um, I put it in terms of bullying and discrimination because they get that. They either themselves have been or have seen it or have friends and they do bullying units in the school now. You know, I hate to simplify it, but it's human nature. And that what we what my parents went through was bullying on an enormous scale. But it's still bullying. And we know how to not do that. We just have to, you know, teach our kids and act in a way that you know, we know what happened to the golden rule. 
and all men are create all people are created equal i mean we have we have the answers how to mm -hmm. prevent never again but we just haven't been good at implementing implementing that so you know when i uh, when i talk about this to my students and teach them one of the things i always and it's not an answer i don't have an answer but a lot of times people say why and the best example that I try to give them is just is to talk about how human beings ourselves, we still seem to have, if you could, you could use the Star Wars analogy, the dark side, I like to talk about, use the word barbarism, <clears throat> you know, that we are still very barbaric and we haven't really learned the lessons of the, the enlightenment, you know, we were supposed to develop a civil society about 350 yeah. years ago. Some it's, of us have. Yeah. Some yeah, of us have. But overall, and... we're still struggling. And uh, I, I sometimes wonder, you have to really get into the psychology of, you know, you take a wonderful country like Germany, wonderful people, very advanced, very. and you stop and look at how they followed, you know, this this madman down the, the trail of, uh, of madness. And, you know, if Germany could do it, anybody can do it, including the United States. And that's, again, I agree. That's why it's so important for us to keep having these kind of presentations. Uh, and uh, I just, you know, we're, we're so thankful that you were willing to share your mom's story with us. And on behalf of the university and the history department, I want to thank all of the folks that, that logged on and, and shared this moment with us. And I guess that's all we have. Uh, yeah. And I hope everybody has a good evening. And uh, we'll go ahead and, and, and log her off. Dr. Crane, stay on so we can keep talking. But those... Okay. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you being here. Okay. Okay, everybody is out, and I guess we're still recording. Let me stop the recording now, sure. because this doesn't have to be reproduced. Um, whoops, stop. Stop cloud recording. Stop recording. Okay, so... That